So I will start by an information that perhaps some people know, but not all of them, that you are a, a young uh, Turing Award winner. And uh, the Turing Award is in some sense considered as a Nobel Prize in computer science. It's only the second time in the history that uh, a French uh, scientist obtained this uh, Turing Award. Uh, the first one being Joseph Sifakis for model checking. So what is your life now that you are a Turing Award winner? Uh, I get even more invitations that I have to refuse. Um, if I want to actually do some real works, which means you know, real research, um, and um, other than that, not so much. Uh, not so much has changed. Um, it's, a, it's a great honor, of course. Uh, it's uh, a bit of a surprise as well. And uh, it's very good for the field of machine learning and AI because in the history of the Turing Award, a lot of uh, Turing Awards are focused on sort of very kind of core computer science, things like systems, compilers, programming langu languages, theory, uh, which is your expertise, actually. Um, not mine, I don't know anything about this. Uh, and then AI, but uh, very often sort of more uh, logic-based AI, which uh, also is very close to sort of core computer science. So things like, like machine learning um, have, have sort of received very little attention from the, the, the Turing Committee in the past. It's a bit of a new thing. I'm really happy that they chose to give it to uh, the three of us, uh, Yosha Benjo, Jeffrey Hinton, and, and myself. Okay, now I have a complaint. Uh, Facebook has a, a research labs, and you, you hire a lot of scientists, which is good. But tomorrow, if you want, you can hire all the scientists. So uh, I don't think it would be good, because these scientists are most often also professors, and they have to teach. But more seriously, how do you see the interactions between uh, industrial labs like Facebook ones and, and French lab and CNRS labs in particular? Yeah, I think it's a very important question. So um, I'm myself part-time at Facebook. I spend part of my time as a professor at New York University. So I kind of share my time between the two. I think the two worlds are very complementary. People work on, with different assumptions in the two worlds. And so that kind of drives them to work on different topics. They also have different kind of resources uh, at their disposal. So a lot of good ideas come from academia or from public research. Uh, a lot of the sort of practical things, of course, the, like the good results in, I don't know, machine translation or uh, computer vision come from industry because y you need to kind of scale it up to make it work really well in practice. Um, and there's very good research coming out of, uh, of industry uh, as well, mostly from uh, you know, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, uh, a little bit from IBM and you know, a couple others. Um, I think um, the, uh, the, the, the partnership between industry and uh, public research is, uh, uh, is, very, is very fruitful and it has to be done in a way that is not detrimental to any of the two. So one model that we have uh, pushed and that we are using uh, in the US and Canada as well as uh, a little bit in the UK and in France as well is have people part-time. So um, younger professors generally spend only a small amount of time at Facebook, most of the time in their university. And then, you know, all the people like me, you said I'm a young Turing awardee, but I'm not that young. Um, are, you know, can spend more time because, you know, they kind of pass their, uh, their sort of junior uh, uh, step. Um, so, you know, as you know, we, we have a lot of collaborations uh, in France with INRIAS, NRS, and various universities. Uh, we have uh, 20 PhD students under the CIF um, status. So for those of you who are not uh, from France or don't know, there's a very special thing in France called CIF, C-I-F-R-E, and it's a particular status for PhD students that allows PhD students to spend most of their time in industry. It's under sort of co-advising -advise, from um, a research uh, scientist in industry as well as in academia, and it kind of fosters uh, collaboration. We have 20 of them at, at Facebook AI Research in Paris, um, and uh, it's extremely productive. The students are fantastic. They've produced amazing results. Um, that, you know, found their way into uh, Facebook products, but also, you know, were published and open sourced. And so that's been incredibly, incredibly fruitful. Uh, you know, the, the first batch of students is graduating. Uh, some of them are, you know, going to academia. Some of them are working for, 
Google, some of them are working for French companies, start, you know, doing startups, things like that. So um, I think it helps a lot in sort of uh, building the local ecosystem. And we, we can add that if you're a company and if you have PhD students under this uh, CIFRE system, you get an help from the state. You get help uh, from, the, from the government, yeah. This is not why we're doing it. No, no. But. And I am really convinced that these part-time positions are very, very useful and uh, really helpful to, to develop relations between uh, France, uh, between, sorry, academy and industry. But I have to say that in France, it's not very frequent uh, and it's something that we like to promote in CNRS. So if we can have some uh, double position or part-time position between CNRS or in RIA or French University and Facebook, I think it, it will be good. I think it's good if you if you help us to give some good, good examples of uh, the interests of these uh, double positions. Yeah, no, I think it's a, I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, you know, there is, there is an issue in France, and, um, uh, you know, I hope you're, gonna, you're not going to hate me for say, saying this, but uh, researchers in France are very badly paid, okay? I, I do agree. Okay, good. Um, I, know, I know you do. Uh, and this is also part of the, the, the Villani report on AI, uh, it's very difficult for France to attract top talent in public research or in universities because salaries are so low compared to uh, the equivalent in, uh, say, uh, North America, in Switzerland, in some parts of Asia, and uh, uh, certain types of positions in Germany. So um, it, it, it makes it very difficult to attract talent to France. And I wish when I was a young PhD student graduating that there were research opportunities in France that would have allowed me to uh, to stay in France, and uh, it wasn't the case. So now there are labs like uh, Facebook AI Research, like Google Research in, in Paris, uh, that you know offer this kind of opportunity for young researchers, and perhaps with part-time positions in uh, public research to sort of foster um, uh, interactions uh, between the two. I think uh, French industry also should uh, probably uh, be a take a little more risk in sort of investing in uh, long-term research. This is not a well-established tradition in France, at least not in information technology. It, it has been in other areas, like maybe aerospace and nuclear energy and things like this, but not so much in information technology. So outside of a very, very, very small number of French companies that you can count on the fingers of one hand, there is essentially no long-term advanced research uh, in information technology in, in France. No, no, clearly. And to be, to be precise, for people who are not uh, French, we, if we hire somebody in CNRS, we have no freedom uh, of the salary because they, all the researchers have a civil servant positions, which can have also some advantages. But as if you are recruited after one or two postdocs, and you will start with a salary of uh, less than 3,000 euros and a gross salary, and it is clearly not competitive if you compare to other, other countries. But still, we, we are an attracting country for AI. Uh, we had the, uh, last year, after the report of Cédric Villani, we have a, a decision of the president to make uh, French, France uh, 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 AI uh, st uh, nation. Uh, so we, we do some progress, I, at least I hope. Uh, so what, what, what is your opinion about the, the position of France in the AI international landscape? So France in particular, but uh, Europe in general, has very good education system. So there is a lot of talent, uh, you know, th from the, the quality of the ed education system. So the talents are there, and that's the most difficult thing to build if you don't have it, right? It's talents. Uh, I think there are sort of friction in the kind of, you know, institutions of research, certainly, that make it difficult for the best talents to really flourish. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of people can realize this, a lot of people want to do something about it. It's, it's very difficult given the sort of inertia of uh, decades of, uh, of history. Uh, but, um, but the talents are there and that's the essential. And so what I've been impressed by is the, the growth of the, the sort of technology uh, ecosystem in Paris in particular. Um, particularly in Paris because, you know, France is a very centralized country, so you tend to have a lot of things happening in one place in France. It's more, it's probably as uh, vigorous, but, but more disseminated in Germany, for example. Um, and this is kind of built around, uh, you know, high quality technical uh, science and technology school, engineering schools. Um, and w what we need is, uh, you know, a, a mixture of industry research lab, public research, 
attracting you know some of the best uh, some of the best people, uh, universities, engineering schools, uh, and and startups. And um, I think I think it's happening in Paris. It could be you know faster. You can it can always be faster. But Paris is you know pretty much uh, you know becoming the one of the you know the top places in Europe for for VC investments, particularly in sort of AI related uh, industry. As chairman of Ceneris, what I, I find really fascinating is the fact that AI is in every science. So in Ceneris, we, as it was, it was said in the introduction, we cover all the fields of science. So of course we have mathematicians and computer scientists, but AI is also absolutely useful for chemists to find new molecules, new materials. Our, our friends from physics get a amount of data which is absolutely more than huge and they need AI but we have also a lot of, of research uh, implying people from social sciences and humanities uh, of course they, they have as themselves their own set of data where for which uh, AI is, is useful but also I think it's uh, absolutely needed to develop uh, re uh, research between what we call hard sciences and, and, human and uh, social sciences uh, in, in question of ethics, of uh, to, to to understand why AI is or not accepted by people, uh, all, all these questions. Is all these questions important also for Facebook? Yeah, super important. Um, so you know, I have two hats, right? I'm, I'm, I'm chief science, chief AI scientist at Facebook. I'm also a professor at NYU. And what I did at NYU just before joining Facebook was create a center called the Center for Data Science. And the purpose of the center was to actually bring people from domain sciences like physics and chemistry, biology, uh, social science, uh, etc., uh, in kind of a, a single place and collaborate and sort of invent new methods based on machine learning and AI and statistics to kind of discover, derive new knowledge from data. So a lot of uh, sciences are kind of tr uh, transitioning towards uh, sort of data-centric uh, uh, science, and I, I find that uh, that transition fascinating. So certainly in high energy physics, in astrophysics, uh, in in chemistry, in in genomics, of course, that started many years ago, uh, and and we see the, the the consequences of this in in things like medicine and and and, and various uh, various other domains. In uh, social science, I think is the new frontier. So the the fact that now. We do have large sources of data on human behavior and various places like that, and this could revolutionize the way we do social science. Um, a lot of this data is private, so it makes it difficult to actually for scientists to uh, access it. Facebook has an initiative that allows social scientists to actually access that data through, you know, within Facebook. So Facebook does not distribute that data, but it's, uh, it allows certain scientists to kind of use it inside and, uh, and then publish the results, obviously. Um, this is... Um, uh, managed by uh, Professor Gary King at Harvard, actually, who is kind of the, 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 the focus point of this, uh, of this effort. Uh, so, yeah, I think uh, we're going to learn more about, about humans through AI. You know, the, one of the, the quests for AI is really understanding human intelligence, right? It's not just building intelligent widgets. It's, uh, it's also discovering what are the uh, underlying mechanisms of intelligence and learning. And, uh, uh, you know, if AI can help... Uh, social science, psychology, neuroscience in particular, neuroscience is kind of a big uh, field at the moment. Uh, I think it's very, uh, um, it's very important for science. And how, from your point of view, do we, do we have to deal with questions like ethics and privacy? Because sometimes people seem to think that ethics is a universal concept. I don't believe it. I think that uh, people from states uh, or people from China they do have a different ethics than in Europe. They are not better or worse, but they are different. We can see your eth the ethics of the America regarding guns. It's clear clearly uh, we do not have the same ethics in Europe. So from your point of view, with your double culture, if I can say, uh, how can, can we deal with that? Because if, if I discuss with you as a scientist and an NYU researcher, Probably you have, will have one position, but if I discuss with you as a scientist of Facebook, how can I, can I be sure that you will not promote first the Facebook interest? And since all the researchers, not all the researchers, but a lot of researchers in AI, as we mentioned, have double positions, mm -hmm. uh, how can we manage that from your point of view? 
Okay, so first, uh, I think as researchers, what's important to understand at Facebook AI Research, the research that is practiced is open research. Nothing is secret. All the code is distributed in open source. Uh, all the work that we do is generally on public data sets because we sort of invent new methods, so we, we want to be able to compare our methods with other people's. That means we work with public data. Now, there is a phase where when a research project works well, we want to perhaps, you know, we have a new system for translation and it works really well on public data. Um, then we talk with engineers within the company or applied, research, uh, uh, applied researchers that, you know, take this and train it on internal data, et cetera. Um, uh, so f from the point of view of research, this, it's the, que the ethical questions are very similar to the ones you ask yourself in, in academia, really. There's not that much difference. Now, how a technology is going to be used is an interesting question. So, um, one of the reasons um, I received the, the Turing Award is for the invention of convolutional neural net networks, which is a method that's practically universally used now for image recognition. Uh, so, it's used for very good things like uh, medical image analysis, you know, diagnosis, diagnosing, uh, 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 I don't know, breast cancer or something from, from mammog mammographies and things like that. Uh, it's used for uh, road safety, for you know, driving assistance for cars to, to avoid collision, to basically drive a car more or less autonomously on a highway, uh, for environmental monitoring, for all kinds of stuff that are for you know, content filtering on, on, on Facebook as well. But it's also used on a very large scale in China for basically spying on people all the time. So Kai Fuyi was here just before and um, he, he, he knows that firsthand. Uh, there, is, uh, there are cameras everywhere in China and there is very large scale face recognition that's connected with uh, the, the Chinese government. Um, you said ethics is really very local and in that case the Chinese population finds that kind of normal and they actually kind of think that it increases security and so um, this is not a compromise that, you know, people in Western Europe would do because of uh, uh, sort of, you know, you know, protection of privacy. Um, uh, Facebook does not operate in China for the, for the reason that they don't want to actually give access to the private data to the uh, Chinese government. Um, companies like Facebook and Google are extremely protective, despite what you read in the press, are extremely protective of the data of their users. Now, that said, uh, when you deploy an AI system, that, for example, picks which content to uh, show people and which one to filter out, like hate speech and things like this. There are very, very deep ethical questions there that are not technological questions, although sometimes the solutions have some you know, technology behind them, but they are really political questions. Um, so it's, it's not like Facebook does not see itself as having the legitimacy to decide what content is appropriate. It's actually asking governments, which is why Mark Zuckerberg was in France last week, it's asking Mark, uh, the French government to basically give guidelines as to how to uh, you know, design a policy for, for content acceptability. Those are important ethical questions. They're not really connected with AI per se. They are connected with um, data statistics, perhaps a little bit of machine learning, but it's more um, you know, broader, broader questions. And probably you will agree. Uh, some people sometimes ask, but what, what remains to do in AI? And I think this, this example is a good one. The fact that to detect, uh, say, bad uh, comments or text is not so easy. Uh, because we all know that people who want to, to spread uh, racist or homophobe uh, uh, things, they can do, do it using some uh, codes. And, uh, and that's, that's clearly an area of research, isn't it? Yeah, so we, we do a lot of research on you know, understanding content, uh, partly for content filtering, not just to decide what content to, to block, but also to decide what content to show you. So figure, figure out what are you the most likely to be interested in without sort of putting you in, into an information bubble. There's important questions there as well. Um, and, uh, and, and that goes through understanding content, understanding the content of images, understanding text, um, and then, of course, there are sort of obvious applications like, you know, translating a post into another language so that you erase uh, language barriers, um, generating captions, captions for images so that uh, visually impaired can figure out what's in, what's in an image, things, things of that type. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of research. Uh, a lot of research also takes place uh, that attempts to 
lower the necessary amount of data that is necessary to train a system. Uh, that's very important, for example, for translation. Um, you know, people use several thousand different languages on Facebook. Um, you know, something like 2,000 or so for the main ones. So if we want to be able to translate every 2,000 language to every other 2,000 language, right, that's, that's kind of 4 million translators, we don't have the data to train this. And so what we need to do is basically train systems to know how to represent language independently of the particular language uh, uh, that is used. And then, uh, you know, train another system to generate sentences in one particular language from this internal representation of meaning, if you want. Uh, that's very, very interesting uh, work. Uh, some of that work, actually, the most interesting work in this area was done here at Fair Paris by PhD students who are resident uh, in the lab. Well, time goes too fast. Uh, you, you need to invent, we need to invent some time machine, but uh, uh, we discuss about the, the position of the different countries in, uh, in the world concerning AI, and I am convinced that a, a key issue is the one of education. And, uh, and probably we, we have in France to make more, more efforts in, the, in the terms of education to AI. And I'm also convinced that we do not need only to have PhD students. We also need to have bachelors in computer science, uh, master in, compu in, co in AI, more generally, sorry. Uh, wh what do you think about that? Yeah, so economists, I'm not an economist, of course, but economists I talk to uh, describe AI in their, in their terms as a general purpose technology, GPT. Which, and by this, they mean that AI is going to uh, disseminate in all corners of the economy. It's probably going to take 10, 15 years for this to happen. The, the main factor that limits the dissemination of um, AI in the economy is the speed at which people learn to use it. And, and for a country or uh, a continent to take advantage of technological transformations of this type, basically the best thing you can do is invest in education. So it's not just primary, primary education, it's also um, adult education, um, training, you know, job training, things like this. And you need people at all levels, right? It's not just researchers with PhDs, it's not just engineers with masters, it's uh, people at every level. So if you think about, you know, back uh, several decades, how long it took for computer technology to really sort of uh, be ubiquitous, you know, it took, it took 15 years. And originally, people thought they would never learn to type on a keyboard. Everybody now types on a keyboard, right? Um, you know, learn to use a mouse, like you, you learn how to deal with a windowing system. Everybody knows that uh, today, but it took a while. And it's not until that happens in the broad population that you see an increase in productivity, which economists, you know, it's the only thing economists are interested in, right? It's, you know, how much wealth is produced by how we're worked. Uh, and what they say is that for AI, it's probably going to take another 10 years before we see an effect of uh, sort of AI technology on productivity. And so, you know, uh, France, Europe, the rest of the world has about 10 years to catch up and um, educate its population to uh, use the new technology. We, we all know, and uh, we too in particular, that a lot of people remain afraid about AI. Uh, I am among the ones who think that the, the number of opportunities is absolutely fascinating, in particular in science. Uh, and as I said, uh, in CNRS, clearly, it, uh, we, we show every day how AI can be a real revolution also for science, and not only for society, uh, but for, for science also. Uh, so, perhaps to conclude, because it remains only 48 seconds, uh, what do you think, how, how can we promote AI in all the sciences, and how can you help CNRS to do that? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, people sometimes think about the, the dangers of AI first, right? There, and, and some dangers don't exist, right? The, the Terminator scenario where AI take over the world, that nobody is really worried about this, nobody serious is worried about this. Um, what, we have to keep in mind that AI applied to medicine and transportation is going to save lives. Uh, it, it's very clear. Uh, so that's, you know, a big benefit. Uh, and then there is, you know, all kinds of stuff, access to information, education, translation, uh, connecting people with each other, which is really what Facebook is all about. Uh, and then science, and science is really what drives uh, technological progress, uh, economic growth, uh, and, uh, you know, more uh, kind of, uh, well-being uh, in, in, in humanity. So, um, you know, it is the hope of a lot of people in that field that uh, AI will have a very large positive impact on uh, everybody's life. So, some AI tells us it's time out. It's so. time out. <laughs>
Thank you. Merci.